How are you? Good morning. I'll have a seat. I'll have a seat. Hi, come on. <laughs> You're coming prepared with your Bible and everything. I like that. Come on up. <laughs> you want to sit up here? Come on, you can come sit with us. Yeah. So, do you all know what an emoji is? What's an emoji? What's an emoji? So, so there's sometimes they're silly, aren't they? Yeah. What, what's an emoji? And so you can use a, a you can write words, and then and then it'll turn into like a picture of something, and then you can send the picture instead of the words. So like if you type the word happy, it'll show a little happy face, right? That's an emoji, right? Yeah, they have, they have purposes for them, right? So in other words, an emoji takes the place of a word, so that way you're sending a message that way. Well, I, I don't really use emojis. I, I didn't even know I had them on my phone for the longest time, honestly. I have them on my tablet. You have them on your tablet? Yeah, I bet, I bet we all kind of have them. How many of y'all use emojis out there? Anybody? Yeah, some of y'all use emojis, some probably more than others, right? So I was texting my kids, and the way that I text, and if I text you, just know this is how I do it. I text in full sentences, and I use punctuation. It's just me. It's the way I do it. And I think a lot of people do that. Maybe it's a generational thing. I don't know. But my kids, every time I was texting them, they thought I was angry. I would say, hey, it's time for dinner. And my kids would come downstairs, and they're like, why are you yelling at us? And I was like, Whoa! I'm not yelling, I'm just letting you know it's time for dinner. And so I asked my wife, what, how, why do they read it that way? She goes, just put a couple of emojis in there. And I was like, emojis? She goes, yeah. And I said, does it matter which emoji I put in there? And she goes, no, just put any emoji you want. So I, the, right, so the next day I texted, hey, dinner's at six, giraffe face, tennis racket, apricot. <laughs> and my kids texted back, love you too, dad. <laughs> I don't get the emoji thing. I know there's a purpose for them, but I, I also know that it's something that I need to learn and, and understand, and that way I can communicate better with my kids. Today, we're going to be hearing a lesson about the purpose of the law, and that Jesus is talking to people that work in the church, and how they've kind of forgotten what it was for, and that doing things the same way they've always done it, over time, they've forgotten what it was for, kind of like the emojis and stuff. Yeah. Like a heart emoji, yeah. I mean, sometimes I'll send an emoji and, and my wife will think, that's not, the, that's not a happy face, that person's crying. And I don't know the difference. And I don't sometimes know what they are. So sometimes we maybe need help to remember what's the purpose behind things. We're going to be talking about that today in the sermon. Will you pray with me, everybody? Let's pray. Thank you, gracious God, for reminding us that at the center of it all is you and that you are the purpose, and that you are the reason. Help us to turn again toward you today using whatever language and emoji we can find. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So in seminary, at the very end, you are preparing to go to a church to get your first call. And um, one of the professors, this pastor, looked at us as a class and said, when you get there, rule number one don't change anything for one whole year. And I said, why? And he looked at us and he says, if you want to be there year two, don't change anything for a whole, right? So my first call was this great little congregation outside of Brenham. Uh, great church, wonderful people, good ministry, still happening out there, and I love them dearly. Um, and when I got called out there, there was something that immediately I recognized, this has got to change. And I uh, was really wrestling with how to do it. They communed every first and third Sunday. And a lot of churches out in that area would do that. Every first and third Sunday, they would do communion. And um, I went to the worship board, and I went to the council, and I said, why are we not communing every Sunday? And uh, I said, I would like to, to start communing every Sunday. And they were very resistant to this. And so we had a nice conversation. And, and they told me that this is the way they have always done it. Right. Okay. So one of the gentlemen looked at me and he says, you know, we only commune every other weekend. So that way, when we miss those weekends, it becomes more special when we do. And I said, oh, I see, man, I get that. Communion is very special. Absolutely. I said, but do you know that after church, we have communion. Sometimes I take that communion and I go visit your families and homes and in hospitals and in facilities. And I have communion with them there. Sometimes I have communion three or four times in one day. And every time I take it, it's special. Every time I take it. 
Well, pastor, but we have people that, that work on Sunday mornings and they're out in the fields and they're tending to flocks and they're tending to, to their, to their uh, animals and their livestock and all the things that they have to take care of on Sunday morning. And I said, oh, I know, working on Sunday morning is hard. I get that, you know. I said, but I, I said, so, but, so in other words, they, you make sure that they have an opportunity to come to communion by having it every other? And they're like, yes. I said, but if we offered it every weekend, then they can decide when is the best for them to come. Because heaven forbid if they miss one week, it would be a month before they have communion. So having it every Sunday then offers them the opportunity to come at their leisure when they can. And then this woman piped up who was on the altar guild. And it's always the altar guild, y'all. I'm just teasing. And she said, she says, you expect me to set up communion every single weekend? And I said, oh, heavens no. Let's get more people involved. We can get all kinds of people to learn how to set the table and learn about communion and be a part of the altar guild. And so they changed. And now they're doing communion every single week. And that's when I noticed something else that needed to change. <laughs> and I knew I was walking on thin ice, so I don't know. Just hear me out. So communion was happening, and kids were coming forward. Grade school kids were coming forward, and I would try to hand them communion. And sometimes parents would move my hand, or they would move the kids' hands, and I didn't know what was going on because my theology says that if you come forward and you put your hands out, you receive communion. All are welcome. This isn't my table. This is not your table. It's the Lord's table, and we're here to serve all, and that communion is available to all. And we even learned last week that there's like this beautiful mystery that's involved in the incarnation of Christ and communion, and, and it's something between this symbol and actual body and blood. I've been trying to, to explain this or quantify it. So why am I going to resist and hold back from a child that puts their hands out? I'm going to rely on grace in those moments. But the church didn't, didn't like me doing that. So I went to the council and went to the worship board and I said, why are we doing it this way? And they said, because that's the way it's always been done. And I said, but why? They said, well, you, in fourth grade, you can have first communion. And by the way, we need a first communion class. And I was like, okay, well, we'll make that happen. But can other people come? And they said, no. And I said, okay. I wasn't going to you know, push, push my luck at that point in time. But I called a pastor friend of mine up in Montana and told this, you know, quandary I was in. And she said, oh my goodness, this just happened to me. And the church didn't want to change. So I went and got grapes. I said, grapes? She's like, yes. And I took it for communion. And every time a child came up that hadn't had first communion, I put the bowl of grapes down and I said, take a grape. And the kid would reach in there and pick the grape they wanted. And then I said, this is a foretaste of the feast to come. Oh, <gasps> So the next Sunday, I brought grapes, <laughs> and it was awesome. The kids would come forward, and I explained what I was doing, and they got to participate in communion. These kids that used to look up at their family going, why can't I? I want to be a part of this. We're now a part of it, and they were celebrating. I mean, grapes are perfect, right? It's solid. It's liquid. It's what we make wine out of, and they were participating fully in the, in the meal because that's what the meal is for, for all. They're still doing it today. They have altar guild teams, and one of them is the grape lady. It's really cute. <laughs> I love that church, and I wish them well. So today we're talking about um, the Pharisees and Jesus dealing with how things we've always done it versus what was it originally meant to be. Um, what was the purpose of it to begin with? The Pharisees are looking at Jesus and all the disciples. And the disciples are eating, and they haven't washed their hands. And the Pharisees are saying, why are you letting them eat with defiled hands, Jesus? Why are you doing, is this what you're teaching them? Don't you know the purity laws? Don't you know they're supposed to wash their hands? According to the tradition of the elders, they're supposed to wash the food and even the bronze kettle before they eat this meal. Are you just allowing them to do this? Don't you know they are dishonoring us when they do this? And Jesus, in his beautiful little way, turns the table on them. But before we see how he does this, let's just talk about something real quick. The Pharisees bring up something in this lesson that not a lot of people know about. That's called the tradition of the elders. Who in here knows what that is all about? Fantastic. I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version, okay? We have the, the, the Mosaic Law, the laws of Moses. These are the part of the Old Testament, the 613 laws, the mitzvahs, the things that, that people follow as part of their Jewish faith. By the time that Jesus comes around, we're in the second temple period. The Pharisees are now in charge of the temple. And there's something that has been passed along called oral law. 
that are based off of the original law, but they're kind of interpretations of it, amendments, whatever you want to call it, but things have changed. Now there's different reasons because people have changed. Time has passed. Of course things are going to change. We are not worshiping like we did 100 years ago. Things change as time progresses. The issue is, is that these tradition of the elders are now hindering people from what was originally intended. And Jesus is pointing this out, which has to deal with the concept of um, uh, unwashed hands. All of a sudden they are, what's the word? I just lost it. Unclean, uh, defiled. Wow, that word just escaped me. Their, their hands are defiled. To the Pharisees, according to the tradition of the elders, if you're defiled, that means you are no longer pure, you are unclean, you are common, and you are not allowed in the temple because you would dishonor the temple and the people in it. And so it was not honorable to do so. And so they're questioning Jesus and his disciples, because they are not being honorable in doing this. And by the way, if they're unclean, then everybody they come into contact by its own nature becomes unclean. And so they're supposed to wash to become clean. Moses, when the law was given, the concept of defiled had to deal, if you touched anything that was decaying or dead or, or uh, bloody or unclean, you weren't allowed to be in the presence of God until you were washed. So in other words, to wash was to be made clean, was to be made righteous, was to be made pure, was so that way you could be in God's presence. Somehow, some way, that had lost, gotten lost in translation or traditions or, or as it moved forward, and they'd lost what the heart of the law was, was so that way we could be in the presence of God. And so Jesus looks at them and he quotes from Isaiah, and he says, the people honor me with their lips. In other words, they're just giving lip service to what the laws are, but their hearts are far from me. And when Isaiah wrote this, the heart, that's the center of everything. That's, that's our emotions, that's our spirit, that's our intellect, that's our caring, that's our compassion, our empathy. Everything was the heart. And so in other words, he's saying you're giving lip service, but you're not giving yourself over to God. In vain do they worship me and they teach human precepts as if they are doctrine, as if they are gospel law, as if they are the final word. And he looks at the crowd and he says, guys, it's not what you put in that defiles you. It's what comes out. It's what comes out of our human hearts. And then he goes through that laundry list of things that nobody likes to read, <laughs> nobody likes to say, because we do them all, every single one of them, we do. I know people saying, I've never murdered anybody. You've murdered somebody's character. We've all done these things. And Jesus says, it's from within the human heart that the evil intentions come from. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, adverse, wickedness, licentiousness, whatever that means. Deceit, envy, slander, pride, folly. All of these things come from within a person. And he's pointing to them saying, God desires your heart. God wants you to be in God's presence. Not just to honor some building or some place that you're going to walk into. We can't wash away the brokenness that we are. But in baptism, we're accepted as a child of God. In this sacrament that we celebrate, we are washed clean in that sense. We are a child of God. We are named, we are claimed, we are chosen, we are one of the body of Christ. When we come to the table, we taste and see that God is good and we all receive the same thing. And Christ is in us and we take Christ out into the world. And we come as we are, broken, and Christ makes us whole through the sacrifice that, that God gave through Jesus Christ. God desires our hearts. And we get an opportunity to practice that every single weekend. And I don't know why you came to church today. Some of you came to church because your parents dragged you. That's fine. Some came to church because that's what we always do. But hopefully we're here right now in this moment seeking God to be in the presence of the divine because that's within each and every one of us in our hearts. It's available right now. And when we go out into the world, we get to share it. So as you come today and you gather around this table, you too are going to receive a foretaste of the feast to come. And it's the hope that we go out into the world and share that with others. Amen.